All right. Good morning, everybody. Good to be here with you in Sunday school. Um, I have this prepared. I've been working on it all week. And uh, I want you to know before we get started that I love you. OK, let me just say that I'm not trying to start anything. I just want to show you what the Bible says. I know some denominations teach this a little different. So we're going to teach this the way the Bible says it. And hopefully you'll agree. Amen. I know two things. I know if you love God, then you'll love this sermon. And if you love the Bible, then you'll love this teaching because I'm only going to go to the Bible. And I'm hoping when we get to the end of this, you might go, oh, I didn't know the Bible said that. <laughs> I love that. I just love to see when people go, oh, oh, you know, just it's exciting to see people learn things. So let's start in Romans chapter 12. We're going to go to Romans chapter 12. We're going to look at the offices of the church. And I've got them on the back here. But I wanted to show you before we got started that in the Old Testament, there were three offices. Did you all know that? In the Old Testament, before Jesus died, there were three offices that a person could have. Usually, one had one or maybe sometimes two. There was the prophet, priest, and king. And example of some prophets were Elijah, Jeremiah, Isaiah, you know, etc. Those were the prophets. God spoke to them and through them. And they would come and say, thus saith the Lord, and they would speak the words of God with the Holy Spirit in them. It was God speaking through them. Then you had priests, and the priests had to come from the tribe of Levi. You know, Aaron was the first. And the priests, do we have priests today? No. The only priest today in the New Testament is Jesus Christ. Yet some denominations, they have their own priests. It's kind of weird because we don't see that in the New Testament. Then you have a king. In the Old Testament, there were kings like David and like Solomon and things like that. So you had prophet, priest, and king. Now Jesus is all three of these. Jesus holds all three of these offices. He came as a prophet. He is a priest. He's in heaven now, and he will come back as the king. And sometimes in the Bible, you have types of Christ. Sometimes they were only one. Sometimes they were two. I think, um, uh, was it Moses was called the king of Jeshurun, and Moses was a prophet, but Moses wasn't a priest. And you had um, other ones like that. King Saul. King Saul was a king, but he wasn't a priest, but he did prophesy, you know. And they were like, is King Saul among the prophets? So these are the three of the Old Testament offices. Now, what about the New Testament? Well, the New Testament church, we only have two. We're going to get into those two here in a minute. But there were more. But now there are less. There's only two. And I can't wait to explain this all to you. But let's start by reading Romans chapter 12, verse 1 through 5. We've got a lot of verses. I believe we can get through this if I don't get off on any tangents or rabbit holes or rabbit trails. And uh, we'll get th through this. But Romans chapter 12, verse 1 through 5. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say, through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. You know, sometimes in the Old Testament, they thought more highly of themselves, especially a guy that was a king. Well, I'm way up here and you're way down there. That's not how we're supposed to think. It says not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same, what? Office. So we being many are one body in Christ, and every one members of another. Some of us may have an office that others don't. That doesn't mean I'm better than you, or Pastor Mike's better than you, or that you're better than us. We're all the same in Christ. And what we should be doing is working together, not against one another. Amen? That's important. So I wanted to start with that verse where it talks about not everyone has the same office. Sometimes God calls a person to be a pastor or a deacon. But that's for today. You might not have that calling. So you come to church and you sit here and you support us. Do you know just coming to church is a blessing to a pastor and that supports him and encourages him? Just showing up really encourages us. So we're going to look at the offices of the church. And in the New Testament, the offices of the church are the pastor, also called an elder, or also called a bishop. Now I put up here, not a reverend, because Psalms 111, Psalms 111, 9 says, holy and reverend is his name. Yep. I don't like it when people call me Reverend Breaker. I kind of go, please don't say that. Now, I know Reverend means holy, so I understand why people call themselves reverends. They're trying to say they're holy, but a lot of people I've met that call themselves a reverend were the least holy people I ever met. Have you ever noticed that? So let's stick with the Bible terms, pastor, elder, and bishop. And we're going to look at all these verses today. 
But when we get to the New Testament, turn over with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And we need to understand how to rightly divide. Oh, and by the way, if I didn't say this earlier, part of this message is kind of a catch-all, if you will. Because I get four or five different questions all the time about a lot of the stuff we're going to talk about today. And so I just thought to myself, man, this will answer all those questions. Maybe people quit emailing me these questions and I'll have a little bit more time to not have to answer them. Because these are many of the same questions that I'm getting over and over and over again as we get through this. But 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 28 through 21, when it comes to the New Testament, this is talking about in the New Testament some of the what were offices in the New Testament church. Now, you must rightly divide. You must understand that Acts is a transitional book. So some of the offices that were in the early church are not there anymore. And we're going to see that. And I'll explain that to you. But let's read 1 Corinthians 12, 28 through 31. 1 Corinthians 12, 28. We read, And God had set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, Thirdly, teachers, after that, miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. So see, those are what were offices in the early church. Hi, guys, come on in. But look what it says, verse 29. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles? Like, does, do these still exist today? Do they still do these things today? Do all have the gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues and do all interpret? But covet earnestly the best gifts... And yet show I unto you a more excellent way. So here's what the Bible just mentioned. And we're going to look at how some of these were in the early church. And some of those are not still here for us today. And I want to explain that to you. Because like I said, people have a lot of questions. So we need to look at these. First of all, apostles. Apostles. Are there apostles today? Well, some people say, yeah. Some people say, I'm an apostle. Apostle literally means one cent. But you know that in the Bible, the apostles, did you know there's only 12 of them? I'm going to show you a verse that there were only 12. Yep. So how could there be some today? So I want to show this to you. Now, like I say, I'm telling you this out of love. All right. I'm not attacking anyone. If you believe in apostles, I just want you to know from the Bible why I'm saying what I'm saying. And I believe you'll see it in the Bible. So let's turn over to Matthew chapter 10. I'm going to have you turning to a lot of verses because I want you to see this isn't just our denominational belief. This is the Bible. Okay. And according to the Bible, the apostles were the hand-picked men of Jesus. Matthew chapter 10, verse 1 through 4. And they had to live during the time of Jesus in order to be an apostle. Matthew chapter 10, verse 1 through 4. We read, well, let me just skip down to verse 2. Now the names of the twelve apostles are these. The first, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew his brother. James the son of Zebedee, and John his brother. Philip, and Bartholomew, Thomas, and Matthew the publican. James the son of Alphaeus, and Lebaeus, whose surname was Thaddeus. Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent forth, and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not. But go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. How interesting that the the apostles were only sent to Jews. Isn't that interesting? These original ones. Now let's turn over to Acts chapter 1. And I would love to read, I'm going to have to pass over some of this scripture and ask you to read this for yourself. I hope you're taking notes. Amen. It's always good to bring a piece of paper and take notes every, every week so you can go home and study some more. But in Acts chapter 1, something takes place. Verse 15 through 26. And again, I, I just don't have time to read this. But um, someone went and hung himself. Who was that? The one that betrayed Jesus, Judas. And so the apostles got together and they said, well, there should be 12 of us. There's only 11. What do we do? Well, I think they jumped the gun yeah. because they got ahead of themselves and they chose two men. And then they said, let's cast lots to see which one it is. Now, how does that work out for you? Isn't that gambling? <laughs> I don't know. But they chose a man named Matthias. And they chose him to be the twelfth apostle. But you never hear of the name of Matthias ever again in the Bible. So was that them choosing or was that God choosing? I've always wondered. It almost sounds like that was them choosing who they wanted to be their apostle. Now again, I don't have time to read here, but it talks about they chose the other apostle and they said it was someone that had to be there from the time of Jesus. So this is uh, who they chose. But now let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 9. It appears God chose somebody else. Amen. Because we clearly see through the rest of the New Testament that God chose a man named Paul. That's right. 
And so it looks like he's the one that God says, no, no, that's the one I really wanted because there's only 12. Now, why do you say there's only 12? I'm going to show you that verse in a minute. I got to show you all these verses, but look at this. First Corinthians chapter 15 and verse nine, Paul says, for I am the least of the apostles and am not meet to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But look at verse 8. I want to read verse 8 too. And last of all, he was seen of me also as of one born out of due time. So Paul refers to himself as an apostle born out of due time. He says, I'm the least of the apostles, but he did say, I'm an apostle. And when you go over to Romans chapter 11 and verse 13, what does Paul say? Romans 11, 13, Paul says he is the apostle to the Gentiles. So we have 13, except we only have 12 because who fell? Judas. And then Matthias comes in, but we never see Matthias. So he worked with them, but it doesn't sound like God said, hey, I want Matthias. Now, let's go to, um, let's go over here to Revelation 21 and verse 14. Let me tell you why I say there's only 12 in the eyes of God. All right. Revelation chapter 21 and verse 14. Look at what it says, Revelation 21, 14. And the wall of the city had 12 foundations and in them the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Now, I'm not going to debate with you. You might say one of them was Matthias and not Paul. I think personally it was Paul. But I believe that the Bible teaches there are only 12 apostles in the mind and eyes of God. So people that run around today and say, I'm an apostle, I'm an apostle, you have to wonder about them. Because that was the early church and the apostles were there and they were the hand-picked men who had to be there and see the time of, of, of Christ. Uh, let me show you something, though, in Revelation chapter 2. As you're reading your New Testament... Remember what happens. There's a transition taking place from Jews to the church, from uh, Peter to Paul. I mean, there's all this stuff taking place. And as the apostles went on and did their ministry, you see that a ministry is accompanied with miracles. And you see those miracles are lost. So I see those 12 apostles were the only apostles. After that, there weren't any more apostles. But today they believe in many churches, we're apostles. Well, look what happened in the early church. They went along so long, and all the apostles died off, except for the last one who lived, which was John. And look what John says in the book of Revelation. John chapter 2 and verse 2. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles, and are not, and hast found them liars. So, Revelation 2, 2, John tells us in his day, the last apostle, there are people running around saying, I'm an apostle. No, I'm an apostle. And they all tried to trick people into thinking they were apostles. And he says, no, they're liars. Right. Because the Bible shows there's only 12. Mm -hmm. So, what does that mean? Well, we have a lot of churches today. People run around, I'm an apostle. I'm very leery of those people. And they claim to have what they call the signs of the apostles. And we're going to get into that here in a minute. I'm going to show you about these signs and other things. But let's look at prophets real quick. Are there prophets today? Under the Old Testament, there were men that went around and spoke and preached, and the Holy Spirit in them spoke the words of God, and they gave you the Word of God, and that became Scripture. That's what most of the Old Testament is, the prophets. The New Testament, they prophesied, and that became Scripture. But do you realize that it's completed, the New Testament? Yes. And that, that we don't have any new scripture coming out, like some church teaches. Oh, this guy saw two angels and wrote another testament or something. Do you know that? No. You know why we know that's not true? Well, because of the Bible. Now, there were, and like I said, I'm going to run out of time in this, so I'm just going to have to throw out the verses. But in Acts chapter 11, verse 27 through 28, and in Acts 21, 10 through 11, there was a man named Agabus. And the Bible says that Agabus was a prophet. And that's pretty late into the book of Acts. So he was prophesying. But are there prophets today? Well, do you realize the New Testament hadn't been finished yet? So God was using prophets until the New Testament is finished. And I believe the Bible is very, very, very clear that when God gave us the completed Bible, no more does he have to give us any prophets. Now we have the scripture. Let me show you that. 1 Peter chapter 1, and verse 19. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 19, even Peter tells us this. Did I say 1 Peter? 2 Peter, excuse me. 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 19. 2 Peter 1, 19. We have also a more sure word of prophecy. Whereunto ye do well that ye take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts, knowing this first that no prophecy 
of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophets came not in old time by the will of men, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So it's talking about the Bible, and it says the Bible is our more sure word of prophecy. Do you understand that? Well, what we have in the world today, and all over YouTube, you've got to watch out for it, is they say, well, God gave me a vision. And a lot of people, they spend their time watching YouTube, all these visions that they say people gave them, or prophecies. And you know what's funny to me? 99% of the time, they turn out to be wrong. Right. <laughs> so how could that be God? You mean God's a liar? Or maybe they're the ones that aren't. I don't go by that. I don't waste my time. If some guy says, God gave me a vision or a prophecy or a dream or something. You know, maybe he did. I don't need to know. Because I don't want to base my doctrine on what you said. Right. I have to base my doctrine on what the Bible says. Because I know the Bible is true. I don't know if you are. So I'm very leery of that. And I see that the prophets were until the Bible was completed. Yep. Now we don't need them. This is our more sure word of prophecy. Are you with me on that? I believe that. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and let me show you where Paul tells us that. And you've got to understand this because otherwise you can get into a mess. And that is what causes cults. Yeah. Some man stands up and says, Oh, God just spoke to me audibly and told me this, that, or the other thing. And you go, uh, How come that doesn't line up with the Bible then? <laughs> it couldn't have been God. Definitely not the same God, because God doesn't speak out of both sides of his mouth and say two different things. Right? right? So 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 8 through 10. Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Now, wait a minute. A true prophecy of God doesn't fail. What is he saying here? He's saying there'll be no more time for men to prophesy. There'll be a time when it's all done and we have all the prophecy here completed. That's what he's saying. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Now remember that. We're going to talk about tongues here in a minute. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. And when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. What is that which is perfect? A lot of people say that's Jesus. Why isn't it a capital P? It's a lowercase p. I think that which is perfect is what he's talking about is when the Bible comes, we will have no more men running around as prophets because we have the more sure word of prophecy. Right? I read it to you. The more sure word of prophecy. So no longer men running around prophesying. But, you know, are there prophets today? Well, the only way you can really be a prophet is if you're preaching this book. <laughs> because the prophets of old said, thus saith the Lord. Well, if we read it and we go, thus saith the Lord, then aren't we saying what, so we might be prophesying, but we're not giving you some special revelation that's different. No, we're just telling you. But, so the only true prophet is someone that's truly telling you what the Bible says. Here's an example. If you die and you're not saved, you'll burn in hell. I just prophesied. <laughs> but I said that because that's what the Bible says. If you come to Jesus, trust him as your savior, you go to heaven. I just prophesied. But you see how I'm not saying something outside of the Bible? So if you want to argue that there's still prophets today, well, only if they're teaching the Bible. Right. But that's not what we see in these denominations. We see men standing up and saying, oh, God just told me to tell you this, that, or the other thing. And I just kind of go, uh-uh, I don't, I don't think so. God has spoken in times past, we see in the book of Hebrews. But he's done because he gave us this book. Now, there will be a time in the future that he talks to the Jews and lets them do things like that. But it's not today. Today, we have the settled scriptures. Now, let's look at miracles and healings, okay? So, you see how the early church, these offices are no longer needed because we have the Bible? So, how about miracles and healings? Do we do that today? Are there people that can walk around and, you know, like Benny Chicken, I think his name is. What's that guy's name? Oh, Benny Hinn. Uh, yeah, a Chicken or something. And you know how he, he, well, he has a bad case of bad breath is what I think. Yeah. Have you ever seen him? He'll go, <gasps> and 50 people fall over. I mean, he needs to brush his teeth, doesn't he? <gasps> oh, you just blasphemed the Holy Spirit. Did I? I mean, come on. <laughs> really? You believe that, fella? So they say they have today the ability to do miracles and healings. Well, is that true? Those were called the signs of the apostles. Yeah. And the Bible says there's no more apostles anymore. So let's get into this. Let's look at this. Um, 1 Corinthians 12, 12. Since we're in 1 Corinthians, let's go to 1 Corinthians 12, 12. And Paul says this. Let's see. I wrote 1 Corinthians 12, 12. I think I got that wrong. That's not the verse I want. Maybe it's 2 Corinthians 12, 12. It's the verse that says, so of signs of the apostles. Okay, it's 2 Corinthians 12, 12. Excuse me. 2 Corinthians 12, 12. Truly the signs of an apostle were wrought among you in all patience, in signs and in wonders and in mighty deeds. 
So the Apostle Paul calls it these things here. He calls these the signs of the apostles. Okay? So it was the apostles that were going around and working miracles. Now we don't have to turn to it, but in Acts chapter 5 and verse 12, it talks about how the apostles did miracles and signs, signs of the apostles. Acts chapter 2, verse 42 through 43, it called that the apostles' doctrine. Do you know the apostles' doctrine is different than the doctrine of Paul for us yeah. today? A lot of people don't even know their Bible, don't even realize that. The apostles' doctrine was you go heal so that Jews will believe who you came from, the Messiah. Today, that's a gift that we no longer have. I don't believe in the gift today of a man going around putting hands on people and healing people. Now, some people do. Well, you know what I call them? Hypocrites. You know why? Because if they did have that gift, why aren't they in every hospital? Why don't they go to the hospital and clear it out? Heal everybody. I'm talking the children burn ward. Right? And so those kids come out with baby skin again. Why aren't they in the, in the hospitals where people's legs are cut off and just touch them and the legs grow back? Why don't they do that if they claim to have that? Because that's what the apostles would have done. So do you see how you've got to wonder about those kind of people? How come it's always whenever you go to these uh, healing meetings, what are they called? Those, those silly healing meetings, they call them. Um, Elmer Gentry, you ever see that movie? Oh my goodness, where did that come from? It's a movie about a, a guy that uh, there's this woman healer. And it's, oh, but these, these so-called healing meetings, meetings, do they heal people? They go there and they go, what's your problem? Oh, I have cancer here. Oh, we'll heal for, oh, we declare you healed. You don't see that. I want to see the guy that goes in with his ears missing and they touch his ear and it comes right back. You never see that, do you? I want to see the guy in the wheelchair with both legs cut off and they touch him and he stands up and his legs are there. You don't see, it's always something you can't see, isn't it? So I wonder if these people aren't deceiving people. Who were the signs for? 1 Corinthians 1.22. When God went to Israel, he always sent signs to them that the prophets would do because he called them a stiff-necked people and it was hard for them to believe. And they wouldn't believe without signs. And 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 22 says, For the Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom. So the Jews need signs. Jesus came with signs so that they would believe. Gave that ability to the apostles, and so the apostles had those signs too. Even Paul, the last apostle, had those signs. Look at Acts chapter 19. And he had even greater signs than some of the other ones, some of the other apostles. And um, some of your denominations out there, and I'll just I'll let you know who they are, the Penny, Penny, Pepsi Costals? No, what are they called? Something like that. The, the Penties. Uh, Pentecostal. And then the Charismani... What is it? Charismania? No, no. Charismatics. Excuse me. The Charismatics. They think that you still have this ability to do this. But the Bible says signs were only for the Jews. But look at the sign that Paul had, okay? Acts chapter 19, verse 11 and 12. You say, you're making fun of people. No, I love them. I really care about them. I just want them to read their Bible. I don't want them to be deceived because I was deceived for four years in that, thinking that the healing would take place. And I never got my healing. <laughs> they say, well, was your lack of faith? No, no. Jesus healed people that didn't have faith. You can read that in the scriptures. Acts chapter 19, verse 11 and 12. Paul, and God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul, so that from his body were brought into the sick handkerchiefs or aprons, and the disease departed from them, and the evil spirits went out of all you had to do was mail your handkerchief to Paul. And when he touched your handkerchief, you were automatically healed. And you know what he didn't say? And send your seed donation of $50 to me. He didn't say that like they do on TV. Right? And so he had the ability to heal people. Paul did. Now, as you read the entire New Testament, do you realize that the signs of the apostles were faded out? Do you realize the apostles, those were the last apostles? And you see at the end of Paul's ministry, he can't heal a dead dog. Right. Did you know that? Right. Look with me. Let's go to um, 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Paul gets to the end of his ministry, which by the way, who did it end up going to? He started out a ministry to Jews. Signs are for the Jews. 1 Corinthians 1.22. Then he went to the Gentiles. Do Gentiles need signs to believe? No. No. So look at what it says in 2 Timothy 4.20. Did you know this is the last book Paul wrote, 2 Timothy? Right before he got the ax. 4.20. So the end of Paul's ministry, Paul says this. Erastus abode at Corinth, but Trophimus have I left at Miletum sick. 
Why did Paul leave some guy sick if he had the ability to heal him? Because God began to change things. Yep. Because the Jews rejected their Messiah. Okay, now we're going to the Gentiles. And what did Paul say in 2 Corinthians 5, 7? For we walk by faith, not by sight. Miracles are by sight. Miracles are so you can see something to believe. Well, we're saved by not sight. We're saved by believing without it. So there was at one time apostles that could do miracles. That doesn't exist anymore. Why did Paul leave this guy sick? You think he didn't like him? You think he's like, well, I could heal you if you sent me your handkerchief, but you know what? You really peed me off. You know, I'm not going to. Is that you think that? No, it's because there's no longer a need for that. Because now that the Jews rejected, now he's going more to Gentiles. So I clearly see that. There's another verse, I don't have time to go there, where he re recommends medicine. He says, have a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine often infirmities. Why would he say that? Why wouldn't he say, send me your handkerchief? Because there's a transition. The book of Acts is a transitional book. Now, let me say this. I don't think that anymore exists these offices of a man healing another person. But I do believe that God can heal. Yeah. All right, let me say that. So we do go to God. We do pray and say, God, please heal so-and-so. Yeah. Sometimes he does, sometimes he doesn't. Mm -hmm. I don't know why he doesn't, but sometimes he does. Yeah. So it's not wrong to pray and ask God, please heal. Right. Now, God can heal, but the gift given to men to heal is not around today. It was for Jews. Yeah. So you say, oh, no, no, I, I watch TV, and I see them healing people on TV. Who, are you telling me that's not the Holy Spirit? Well, let me uh, show you something. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 9. Paul tells us about his ministry and how it was to Jews. Then he went to Gentiles and tells us how he was the last apostle and, and how there's no more that gift of healing. And how today we don't go by signs. But then Paul tells us, guess what? In the last days, there's someone going around with signs and wonders. Yeah. Guess who it is? It's not God. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 9. 2 Thessalonians 2, 9. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders. You know who that is? That's the Antichrist. And you know what he's going to do? He's going to deceive people with his signs. Verse 10, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. Yep. You say, oh, but I, I help this TV evangelist. He's a healer. Is it the Holy Spirit through him or could it be the devil? Mm -hmm. You just blasphemed the Holy Spirit. No, I didn't. No. How much money does that guy have in the bank? Mm -hmm. You got to wonder if that guy is really of God. Many of them, they've been married three, four, five times. Many of them, they fall into shame because guess what? They're sleeping with somebody that's not their wife. Many of them are not standing by the book. They don't even have a King James Bible. So you've got to wonder about these things. Now, let's look at tongues. A lot of people like to talk about tongues. A lot of people use their tongue to talk about tongues. They don't even know what tongues are. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 22. What are tongues? Now look, I'm not trying to hurt you. I love you. I just want to tell you the truth. Paul says, have I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? <laughs> I'm telling you the truth. Be careful of these wolves in sheep's clothing out there that claim to be apostles and healers and things like that. You've got to read your Bible and then you'll see through them. And you'll see that all they're in it is for the money. They preach what they call the prosperity gospel. Oh, it's all about prosperity. Well, for them, yeah, because they get rich and you get poor. Because all they say is, send me your money. They say, send me a seed offering. <laughs> I knew a guy, he says, I sent him $2,000 and now I don't have anything. I said, sucker. <laughs> That's what you are. Because if you read your Bible, you know, these people can't do that. I'd rather go to God and ask him to heal me than those people. You know what I'm saying? Uh, my faith is in, yeah, and that's free. Amen. But I trust in God, not in man like that. Uh, especially when they're out there smoking marijuana and doing things behind the scenes like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. There was a guy named uh, Hannah Graff that did Christianity in Crisis. If you've never seen that, uh, I got the audio tape of the book, but I think he made a, a movie of it too. And he showed these famous healers and how they're out smoking pot and drinking and doing all this stuff. Yeah, they're really of God, aren't they? Makes you wonder. Makes you wonder. 1 Corinthians 14, 22. Let's look at tongues. 1 Corinthians 14, 22. Wherefore tongues are for a sign... Oh, well, aren't the signs for the Jews? Yep. 
not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. <laughs> Tongues were assigned to unbelievers, not to people that claim to be believers. Yet you've got whole denominations out there, it's all about tongues, oh. and it's like, no, that was for Jews. And if you think it's for you, then are you an unbeliever? That's my first question. I mean, are you lost? Is that why you don't rightly divide the Bible? I mean, that's just a question. But it says, um, not to them that believe, but to them to believe not. Okay. Now, in the Bible, there was the miracle of tongues. I say there was. Let's go over to Acts chapter 2. Let me show you what it is. It was God taking the mouth of someone and speaking through them in another language that someone else heard. In other words, they just started speaking and the other person heard in their language the wonderful works of God. It was not babbling in the air and no one knows what you're saying. That's what happens in many churches today that say they do tongues. They go, And you're like, what do you say? I don't know. Did you read 1 Corinthians 14? It says you're supposed to interpret. How do you interpret? Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> you can't. So what's going on in many of these churches is they don't even know what tongues are. Right. Let me show you Acts chapter 2, verse 4 through 12. I told you I love you. I'm not being mean. Okay. I just want you to see this in the Bible. Uh, Acts chapter 2, look at verse 4. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Okay? This is the apostles. Now remember, tongues, so what Jews would believe. This is only Jews there, no Gentiles. And always a written, spoken language that someone else understands. That's what a tongue is. I speak in tongues. <gasps> You're charismatic now? Yeah, I guess so. I speak in English. I speak in Spanish. I studied Hebrew and Greek. I'm trying to learn German. My Deutsch is nicht gut. My German's not good. But that's a tongue, something that someone else understands and someone else speaks. It's not blabbering in the air. Okay? I want you to get that. And it says here that the apostles began to speak in other tongues. So they're speaking in other languages. Now watch this. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. That's right. Can it be any more clearer than that? And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue where when we were born? And then it tells you their tongues. Yep. Parthians and Medes and Elamites and the dwellers in Mesopotamia and Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia and Egypt and the parts of Libya about Cyrene and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians, do we hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God? And they were amazed, and rightly so. Because here's 12 men up there that only spoke Hebrew, and maybe Greek, and they're everyone saying something different in a different language, and some guy's going, that's my language, he runs over in front of him to listen. The other guy goes, oh, that's my language, he runs over there in front of him to listen. That was the miracle that it was in their language. Okay? So that's what that is. Now, so is that what it is today? Is that tongues today? Um, I was in the Pentecostal church before I got saved, and they did what they called tongues, and I never understood what was said. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, it talks about having an interpreter so that everyone would be edified. And so uh, I was in that denomination, and finally one time they told me, they said, look, it doesn't matter what they're saying. And many of your Pentecostal churches, this is what they teach nowadays. They say this. They say, speaking in tongues is the Holy Spirit speaking or interceding to God on your behalf in a language that no one understands. And so I've even had people contact me and say, I think it's okay to pray in tongues. And I say, well, what language are you praying in? Because it's always written. I don't know. And I say, you don't know? You need to know. 1 Corinthians 14, there should be an interpreter. Someone needs to interpret that. Well, I don't need to know. And I say, well, tell me again what you believe. Well, I believe the Holy Spirit in me is talking to God in a language that no one understands. I said, stop right there. Yeah. Go to Romans chapter 8. Can God do anything against what he says in the Bible? No. All right. If the Bible says that, I will believe that. You just told me that when you speak in tongues, you don't know what you're saying. And God, the Holy Spirit, is speaking to God the Father in a language that no one understands. They call it a heavenly language. And I just read my Bible and I go, I don't think I can believe that. No. Do you know why? Romans chapter 8 and verse 26. 
Because my Bible says that when the Holy Spirit intercedes to God, it's something that cannot be uttered. Right. Romans chapter 8 and verse 26, Likewise the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. What part of cannot be uttered do you not understand? I was in the Pentecostal movement for four years before I got saved. And I came home, I got saved, I was reading my Bible, and I just felt sorry for a lot of them. And so I went back to Oklahoma to try to reach them. I tried to talk to the pastor, I tried to talk to the youth minister, I tried to talk to the assistant pastor. Well, the deacon, he says, I'm going to show this breaker. And he took me out to eat Demasio Pizza. And he brought his Bible, and I brought my Bible. And he started to give me verses, and I started giving him verses. I said, by the way, what Bible do you use? And he goes, the NIV. I said, well, look to this verse. And he looks and he's like, it's not there. I go, yeah. The NIV takes out many verses. I said, why don't you look up this verse? It's not there. I said, oh, I had a good time with him. And he kept going, why doesn't my Bible have all the verses? I said, well, maybe your doctrine's wrong too. And uh, he told me, he said, we speak in tongues. I said, what is that? What language? Is that English or Spanish or German? Or what, what language? He said, well, it's a heavenly language. I said, look over here in Romans 8, 26. And I took him there. And I said, what part of cannot be uttered do you not understand? Oh, he got mad. I don't know how many demons that guy had, but they were bouncing around back and forth between eyeball and eyeball. And this voice out of nowhere, <sighs> I mean, it was like, whoa, ho, ho, calm down, buddy. Let, let's look at some more verses. People get angry when they realize their doctrine doesn't line up with the Bible. Yep. <laughs> look, I'm not trying to hurt you. I, I'm not, I just want you to know what the Bible says. Why are you uttering something the Bible says you can't utter? All right. Now, here's another question that we get all the time. Um, can a woman be a pastor? All right. Oh, by the way, I didn't go to 1 Corinthians 13, 8. It says, tongues shall cease. Yeah. Right. We read that verse earlier. So, real tongues, you know I speak in tongues because I speak English and Spanish. And I can translate. And so I speak in the real tongues. A real tongue is always a written spoken language. Okay. That's just Bible. I showed you the verses. But, um, how about this one? How about pastor? Okay, so these, some of these are still around today. We have teachers. I teach Sunday school. We have helps. Helps are deacons. And by the way, the deacons, that's in Acts chapter 6, verse 1 through 7. Yep. And they, they said um, something about serving tables. It's, it's helping in the church. And uh, governments, while well, we have church leadership. So some of these offices are still around today. Some of them were only for the early church. Right. In that time, they were still trying to deal with the Jews because Jews need a sign. But offices of the New Testament church, pastor and deacon, these are the only two that we find today. Now, I thought about putting missionary and evangelist up here, too. And I guess we could do that because those are, you know, in the Bible. But really, I'm talking about in the church. Those are sent out of the church. But the pastor and the deacon. Now, again, not reverend. I don't call myself a reverend because that's the name of God. It says holy and reverend is his name. But we have elders, bishops, and pastors. Now, this is a question I get a lot. Can women be pastors? Let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 3. And this is what it all boils down to. <laughs> do you love God in the Bible? <laughs> if you do, you will obey the Bible. If you don't, you'll go against it. Okay? And in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 and 2, it does not say that a pastor is a woman. Look what it says. This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth the good work. Does it say if a woman desire? No. It says if a man. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife. Yep. And then it gives some more stuff here. So how could a woman be a pastor if the Bible says a pastor is to be the husband of one wife? I, I guess there's a way nowadays. <laughs> uh, if a woman marries another woman. But no, that's a completely different subject. We won't go there. That, that, I don't think that works either. All right, let's go to Titus chapter 1 and verse 5 and 6. For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders. Okay, I told you, bishop, elder, is a pastor. In every city, as I appointed thee, if any man be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly. So, two passages of scriptures that says a pastor is supposed to have a wife. We don't see co-pastors, man and wife. Now, let me show you some other verses. And boy, there are people out there that get angry. I've come across women pastors, and I try to be sweet. I'm a nice guy. I don't want contention. But uh, I've come across some women pastors, and I say, Did, do you know what the Bible says about that? No, what? And I nicely show them these two verses I'm about to show you, and they're no longer my friend for some reason. 
But I just want to go by the Bible. Do we all want to go by the Bible? Okay, let's look at what the Bible says. They get confused. That's right. Sure, they were running the Old Testament. Out of, out, of, out of the book of um, out of the book of Esther that was never meant to be. Taken good, out of good point. They're going back to the Old Testament for some things too. But in the New Testament, good point. The New Testament, First Corinthians chapter fourteen, verse thirty-four. Look at what it says in First Corinthians fourteen, and verse thirty-four. Now, the context of this is tongues. But if you will read it, it uses the term unknown tongue. And do you know the word unknown is in italics? And what this is saying in this chapter is if you're in a church setting and there's people there that speak all different languages, that the person that's preaching should preach and another translates that into another language. Yes. And then another one translates that too. That's the unknown tongue, a tongue that's unknown to the church. A guy gets up and he starts saying, Hola, mi nombre es Roberto Renker. Quiero hablar contigo acerca de lo que la Biblia dice. And everybody's like, that's an unknown tongue. Do you know what I just said? Spanish. So, so someone has to interpret that for the edifying of the church. That's what this is talking about. But is a woman supposed to preach in the pulpit? No. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 34 and 35. Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak. That's from the pulpit. That's preaching. But they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. So does that sound like a woman preacher to you? That sounds like the woman preacher is trying to disobey the Word of God. Uh, I don't want to do that. When you disobey the Word of God, does God bless you? No. Or do you end up, you know, being chastised by God because you're going against the way God set it up? Now, people today, that's misogynist, that's sexist, that's... Whatever. We love the Bible. We want to follow it, right? right. So if you want to go to one of those churches, help yourself. We just want to do it God's way here. All right. Now, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 11 through 14. 1 Timothy 2, 11. And in uh, 1 Timothy 2, 11, Let the women learn in silence with all subjection, but I suffer not a woman to teach, nor, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. So women aren't supposed to be preachers or teachers right. in the pulpit in the church. Right. No, does that mean they can't teach Sunday school? No, I, I wish I had time to take you to the verse. There's a verse, I believe it's in Titus, where it says the aged women are supposed to teach the younger yes. women and to teach their children. So there's nothing wrong with a woman in, in a, a Sunday school class for kids. Right. But not from the pulpit. That's the way God said. Now, how about women deacons? Do you know when I went to Honduras, I had the Spanish Bible that I took that everybody else uses. And it said in that Bible, they translated deacon as diocanisa woman deacon, instead of diaconal, man deacon. Do you know that's not in our Bible? It says deacon. And let's go there quickly, 1 Timothy 3. So we have two offices in the church today. It's pastor and deacon. And that's it. Um, so if you want to follow the Bible, we'll do it God's way. Amen? If you don't, there's another church down the road <laughs> that doesn't do it God's way. Have I just shown you what the Bible said? I'm not teaching my opinion. Uh, opinions like armpits. Everybody has two and they all stink. I don't want an opinion. <laughs> all right. I want to go by what the Bible says. All right. First uh, Timothy chapter three, verse eight. This is talking about a deacon. Likewise, must the deacons be grave, not double tongued, not given to much wine, not guilty of filthy lucre. Go on down that way a little ways, if you don't mind, brother. We got you in good yesterday, or last, last week on camera. Everybody knows who you are now. You're famous. No, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. Uh, amen. And it says uh, about the deacon. Not given to much wine, not guilty of filthy lucre. Verse 10. And let these also first be proved, then let them use the office of a deacon being found blameless. Even so must their husbands. Is that what your Bible says? No. <laughs> Even so must their wives be grave, not slanderers, sober, faithful in all things. Let the deacons be the husbands of one wife. So we see men in the offices of the New Testament church. If that offends you, then you need to get right with God. Or go find a church that's not right with God that agrees with you. OK, because we here, we want to follow the Bible. All right. The blood, the book and the blessed hope. Amen. And so, like I said, I'm not trying to hurt anybody's feelings. I just want you to see what the Bible says. OK, now I think we're almost done. This worked out good. Now, like I said, there's evangelists and there's missionaries I could put up here, too. And I see those as men also. 
Okay, I don't see women missionaries. I've, I've made some people mad saying that before. But what is a missionary? He's one sent to go plant churches. Well, can't teach or preach. So how does she start a church? Now, she can get married to a man who's a missionary and go help him. Uh, and, and that's a good thing. Now, these are all what the Bible teaches about the offices. And again, on the back here, for those that just showed up, this is what the offices of the early church were. Some of these aren't around anymore today. So what are we left with? We're left with pastors and deacons. And they are all supposed to be this. When you want to be a pastor, it's called the ministry. You're supposed to get into the ministry to be a what? A minister to others. There are some people out there that claim to be pastors I wonder about. Because they're not interested in ministering to anyone. It's all about them and what they can get. Give me your tithe. Give me this. Give me, give me, give me. My dad or my grandpa used to say, give me died. Because <laughs> when I was a kid, I'd go, give me, give me. He'd go, give me died. Shut up, kid. I'm like, oh. <laughs> That's just, he's trying to teach me. Quit saying it's all about you. Quit saying, give me, give me, give me. Well, there's a lot of pastors out there. They don't know what it is to minister. All they want is to get something. Do you know minister is to give, not take? It's about edifying. So again, be careful of those that claim to be ministers and they're all about money and you sending them their money and things like that. You know, I hardly ever ask for money because I'm trusting God and thank God when he uses people to send it to me. But I'm not up here going, I want your money. You know, I want your soul because I want you to be saved. And after you're saved, I want you to follow this book. That's all I ask. Amen. Just go by what it says. Yep. Don't compromise here or there. Follow every bit of it, even if you don't like what it says. Right? That's what I'm asking. So let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 3, and I'll close. And it's to be a minister, not a tyrant. There are some people get in the pulpit, and they become little popes. Um, I've met many of them. I call them Baptist popes, popes, Baptist popes. They get in pulpits, and they just, oh, they, they browbeat the people, and they're mean, and they're hateful, and they're angry, and it's all about them. And, oh, if you don't do what I say, you know... It, that's not right. It's to minister. Brother Mike is a great minister. You can tell he cares. Amen. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 6. Who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. What a pastor or deacon is supposed to be is an able minister of the New Testament. What I tried to do is, is minister to you today and show you, hey, there's a lot of offices that were in the book of Acts that at one time were part of the church. But we see that transition. Right. We must rightly divide the word of truth. Amen. And who's out there today doing miracles? Better watch out for that because yeah. the Antichrist comes doing miracles, yes. the Bible says. Yeah, right. And he's going to deceive many. As a Christian, I want to get in the book and say, okay, do I look for miracles or do I look for truth? <laughs> because, you know, even the devil can do miracles. No, I'd rather have the truth of the Bible. I want to stand before God and him say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. So I want to close there, but did anyone have any questions or any comments this, this morning quickly? Anybody? I pretty much covered as much as I possibly could as quickly as I could. Anyone have a question or a comment on this? Yes, sir, Brother Tom. What about the priesthood of the believer? Okay, so the priesthood of the believer. In the Old Testament, there were priests. All right? The priest waited upon the people for someone else. In the New Testament, Jesus Christ is the high priest, and we are the priesthood of the believer in the sense that we can go directly to him. We don't have to go to a priest to say, now go tell God this for me. So in that sense, we can talk about the priesthood of the believer. We, in that sense, can be called priests. But it's a spiritual thing. It's not a physical and that was a physical priesthood back then. So if you go to a church and they have priests in that church, are they following the Bible? No. no. It doesn't sound like they're, they're mixing the Old Testament and the New Testament. Does that sound like an able minister of the New Testament if they don't even know the difference? No. No. It doesn't to me. So you've got to wonder about that. Anybody else? Any questions or comments? Yes, ma'am. The helps in the government. Okay, back to this. <coughs> yeah. Are, you, are, are these no longer? No, so I put a little thing here of the ones that are no longer. So the ones that are still here is teachers, helps, and governments. And the government would be the church leadership. That would be the pastor and the deacon. And a help is really a deacon. 
because that's what a deacon was set up to help with, Acts 6. If you'll read that, you'll see that um, Peter was talking about, you know, all these things are coming up and I can't deal with it all. And he said, I need to give myself to the reading of the word and the studying of the word. So they said, okay, let's call some deacons. And they chose seven deacons. Stephen was one of those deacons. And they, they were, to, it, it talked about waiting on tables. Right. One of the things that a deacon was supposed to do is to be there to help any way they can. Modern deacons in churches, well, they wouldn't raise a finger, would they? A lot of them. <laughs> but the deacons of the early church, man, how can we help? What can we do? Well, church needs cleaning. Or, well, uh, maybe set the table. or so. And, you know, um, that's what a deacon did back then. But also, what if the pastor's sick and he can't fill in? Maybe the deacon would do that. So they needed to be men that, that eventually would probably be a pastor. Okay. But, uh, yes, ma'am. During the millennial reign, um, do you think that it's going to be the men... Um, doing the same positions, or will it be different? Well, that's an interesting question. So in the millennial kingdom, you'll have Jews in their natural bodies and Gentiles living there, and then you'll have us in our glorified bodies. And it says in Revelation 1, 5, we'll be kings and priests. So we'll be back here. We'll be ruling with Jesus as kings and priests. So that'll be interesting. So how that works, I don't know exactly, but we'll probably be like mayors of cities and things like that, I guess. But uh, that's because we got saved in the church age. And it's different, the church age, than the other dispensations. Good question. Anybody else? All right. Thank you for being here today. I love you. Let me say that again. And I appreciate you all. And I pray you read your Bible. Amen. Read your Bible. All right. We'll see you next week. God bless. Amen.